Good afternoon. Thank you so much for coming along. Uh, I hope you're enjoying the first day of NDC London, well, unless you've been at the workshops beforehand, in which case this will be your third day of NDC London. Um, out of interest, how many people here are here at their first ever NDC London event? Wow, most of you. Okay, that's great. Uh, well, welcome. It's, I think it's my third year of doing this particular conference. I work, I do NDC conferences all over the world, so it's quite nice to not have as far to come for this one. Uh, so I'm going to be talking today about um, sort of the interplay, really, of, of architecture and organisation, and specifically looking at how microservices and uh, sort of go hand in hand with the, the way we're thinking about IT organisations. So. There's some stuff here if you're not doing microservices, but if you are interested in microservice architectures, there's going to be a lot here for you to think about in terms of how you structure your work and how you get people organized around things. It turns out there's an awful lot of, there's a, there's a huge extent to which this, you know, you can see microservices as purely a, a technical architecture, but it really comes into its own, I think, when you align that with an organizational structure that supports this way of working. Um, and to try to do, trying to sort of, shoehorn microservices into existing organizational structures may not give you the outcomes you want. Um, I, I'm not going to try and convince you that microservices are good or bad. It's more that if you're going to do them, here are some of the things you should be thinking about from an organizational point of view. Uh, so my name is Sam Newman. I wrote a book a while ago uh, on microservices. I'm in the process of rewriting this book. Um, it came out in 2015. A few things have changed. Um, I, I now have to, just, I have to rewrite the second edition, though, and put the word Kubernetes on every fifth word. Otherwise, it just doesn't sell. Um, I also just got a, a new book, just was released at the end of last year, uh, called uh, Monolith to Microservices. That's a book which is sort of a, whereas the first book was like a broad swathe looking at all the impacts of software development and how microservices are impacted. So looking at testing and deployment and sort of architecture and organizational structures. Uh, this book is very much a deep dive, uh, which is trying to help guide organizations that want to take an existing system and migrate to a microservice architecture. Um, I think, which actually I think is the situation that many people are in. So if you want to know the sheer horror associated with breaking foreign key constraints in databases, this is the book for you. Uh, amongst other things. So it is available in the shops now. Um, but we're going to talk about microservices. And here's how I always draw microservices. I draw them as hexagons. I like hexagons. It's become kind of come of a thing for me. It's a nice shape. Um, uh, and, and we see, you know, we see architects like this is a logical architecture. And uh, when we're talking about what makes microservices interesting, maybe from a, a technical or behavioral point of view, the thing we sort of reiterate over and over again is this idea of independent deployability. And often the, you get the, you know, an architecture like a microservice architecture is, is really optimized allow, uh, around allowing you to make changes easily. So what we get aiming for with a microservice architecture is the ability for you to take, make a change to one service in that architecture and deploy that service into a production environment without having to change anything else. Well, there's a lot of other noise. We can talk about microservice architectures. We can talk about Kubernetes and Docker and Go and functions as a service and Kafka and all of this lovely stuff, which you may or may not want to use with a microservice architecture. But above all, it's an architecture which is designed and sort of is very opinionated about this idea of allowing services to be changed and deployed independently of having to change or deploy anything else in your system. That's it. That's really it, the whole purpose of that. Now, of course, that's very easy to say. It's much harder to do. And so an awful lot of the detail is how do we come up with architectures um, that work in that way. We also talk about them being modeled around parts of the business domain. This is actually one of the key ingredients to helping around independent deployability. That's something we're going to explore a little bit in this talk. Uh, but often while we focus on the technical aspects of microservice architecture, that's a lot of what I've, I've done in the past, Often, sometimes the organizational stuff isn't talked about enough, and that's what I'm trying to fix in the talk today. So here we are. I've got my microservice architecture. I want to work on something. I want to get something done. I want to be able to change that service and deploy a brand new version of that shipping service into production without having to change anything else. That's it. That's it. Of course, it's very easy to do in a slide. Right? That's, that's easy. That's an animation. Look, we can see it again if you want. I don't think it's going to help. Um, and, and, you know, there's a lot of technical detail in terms of how I do this. We talk, for example, about not sharing databases. And we'll talk about why that is. And that, that can make these types of things more difficult. Um, 
Anyway, hold that thought. So let's look at other types of system decomposition. So with a microservice architecture, a, mi a microservices are an opinionated style of service-oriented architecture. They are a type of service-oriented architecture, but there's a, a type of service-oriented architecture that has some fairly strong opinions about how things should be done. And one of those opinions is this idea of independent deployability. Another one of those opinions is that we should decompose our application into services that are structured around parts of our business domain. Well, why is that even relevant? Are we just picking ideas arbitrarily out of the air? Well, maybe, but what they, bear with me. So let's look at a different type of system decomposition, and one that might be familiar to many of you. We'll look at maybe what some people call layered or horizontal styles of decomposition. So I've been using this sort of example of a fake domain for a while. This is Music Corp. Music Corp sell compact discs online. You can understand how long I've been using that example for because it sells compact discs online, and I haven't worked out what to replace it with yet, but we'll, we'll get there. Um, we might start setting vinyl, because then it would be at least be a bit more relevant. And we've got our application. It's a standard, standard sort of very simple web e-commerce application running online, web-based system, and we made a decision to split this monolithic application into two parts. And when I talk about a monolith, I primarily talk about a monolith as a unit of deployment, different styles of monolith. Um, so here we can imagine this is all the code is packaged together on a single process uh, with a single data store underneath it, which is kind of a classic view of a monolithic system, although there are other models out there. And we've made a decision that we're going to break this into two pieces. We said we want to scale it, and we've heard about microservices, and we want some of that service goodness, um, and we're going to break it apart so we can do more, because we want to be like Netflix or Spotify for some reason. Um, and we look at our existing code base, and we say, well, actually, inside our existing code base, there's a nice API here. It's a nice, clean API. Why don't we just make that a service API? And so we do something like this. We crack open our application. It's like we take a, a hatchet. We go, <coughs> right. This API that used to be something we'd call inside our process boundary, it's now a services boundary. And a classic place to form that kind of decomposition is maybe around your persistence layer. So here what we've done is now we've got a Music Corp service that renders up our HTML pages to the outside world. None of this single page app nonsense. We're old fashioned. I mean, I say we're selling compact disks online. We clearly haven't learned. Um, so we're serving up HTML pages to the outside world. Um, and on the back end, we've got our persistence service. And that is allowing for the retrieval of state that we store. So information about your customer, the orders, the items that we've got for sale, and obviously manages saving data when that data needs to change. It manages our whole kind of uh, durable persistence of data, but basically it's a wrapper around a database, right? That's what this is. And um, of course, we've done something quite sensible actually, which is we have one team that looks after the, ex the Music Corp website, uh, and we have a different team that looks after the persistence layer. And actually, you know, I think, Having ownership of teams like this makes sense. If you have a service, having that service owned by a team in general is the right model, and we're going to talk about why later on. So, you know, this is okay, but we have issues here. So, how many people here release software uh, at least once a month into production? Okay, most of you. How many of you release software maybe once a week or more into production? Wow, okay, that's a lot. So that's probably about, I don't know, about 5 to 10% of the room. 10% of the room, maybe 15% of the room. This happens a lot. We want to ship software quickly. And what we often find, especially when you're working with organizations that have actually had IT systems for a long time, is the architecture of those applications don't always lend themselves to the fast pace of delivery that we now expect from our systems. And often we look back on architectural styles that made perfect sense when we're releasing software every six months, every 12 months, every 18 months, and now they're not necessarily as fit for purpose in the current age. And that's often the case with architectures like this. Let me posit a simple example. We're going to give our customers of Music Corp the ability to select their favorite genre of music. It's a very simple idea. It goes to your profile page. You click on the drop-down box, and you say, my favorite genre of music is click uh, Death Polka which is a mashup of death metal and polka music. I don't know what I'm telling you, you obviously all know this. So I've selected death polka, it's my favorite type of music. And making that change uh, is a very simple operation, it's one field. Now for that to work with this architecture, to make the changes in my system required for that, I'm gonna have to expose from that persistence layer some information about what the genre options are. 
In my Music Corp service layer, I'm going to have to construct some sort of drop-down combo box with all the entries in that combo box. When I select my favorite genre, I'm then going to have to save that information, and that will call back into the persistence layer. So a very simple change in functionality. I've added one field, and I'm now going to have to make that change in two different places. Moreover, I'm going to have to coordinate that change across two separate teams. So I'm going to have to somehow work out the, the right order in which the sequences work. And I'm either going to have to choose, decide to deploy both of those changes together as a single deployment, which makes, this, makes for a lockstep release, or otherwise I'm going to maybe have to release the back-end persistence layer first and then the front-end music corp layer or some other sort of combination of that. Now, you're at a tech conference, right? So you're here learning about amazing technology, thinking about your skills and how to grow, what you're going to do, thinking about all the amazing things you're going to do with the knowledge you, 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 you gain from, this, from this, these, these few days. But let me break it to you. 75% um, of what you do in your career is going to be taking something out of a database and putting it on a screen. And if you're very lucky, the other 25% of your career is taking something from the screen and putting it back in a database, right? <laughs> That's most of what we do. And the rest is kind of just how we make that efficient. But in this sort of type, these types of layered architectures like this, this isn't an efficient operation. We're having to make changes in lots of places to make simple things like that happen. Now, I would say at that point, what you've got is a system that, you know, that, that is showing low levels of cohesion, of business functionality. I'm having to go to multiple parts of my system to make a change, which points to a low degree of cohesion. I mean, the concepts of cohesion, um, as we tend to use it in terms of source code, actually come from the early days of structured programming back in the uh, mid-60s and early 1970s, back when we were talking about how to design systems which make us uh, sort of modelled around modules. Pro programs were getting bigger and more complicated. We needed ways of breaking those programs up, and modules what we were talked about. So then it was all about how can we create and find good module boundaries. And so these terms are talked about, cohesion. The code that st changes together should stay together. I don't have to go to five different modules to change some piece of functionality. I want to reduce the number of modules that I have to change in order to ch make a change happen. And service boundaries are no different to module boundaries in that regard. So here we have simple load architecture often has this issue of low cohesion. In many ways, this architecture is optimized around us just making changes to the database layer or just making changes to the UI layer. How many of your features really would that apply to? Something else we'll learn from the days of structured programming is a thing called Constantine's Law. And so Constantine's Law states that as your cohesion reduces, your coupling increases. And this makes sense. Coupling is a property where I have to change one thing, I also have to change something else. If my functionality is spread across all of those layers, I'm going to have to change lots of layers together to make that change happen. So as we, as we reduce our cohesion, we increase our coupling. That sounds like not great if what we now expect of our architectures is the ability to be able to make changes and deploy them quickly. So I'm not saying this is a bad architecture. I'm just saying that these styles of architectures tend to not necessarily live up to what we want out of them, given that our business conditions and our expectations of our customers have changed. And this is a very simple example of a layered architecture. This is a much more fine-grained snapshot of a system I worked on many years ago. This was for a ticketing company based here in Europe. Uh, they had about 60 services, and they had a very slow pace of change. And, a, and I, I got chatting to an independent contractor who was working there. They'd done an excellent piece of work. Uh, how many people here are big fans of Jira? Uh, OK, so that's how many people here are made to use Jira, otherwise they don't get paid? Yeah, that's right, OK. Um, there's some great stuff you can do with tools like Jira. I mean, you could probably also do it with TFS, but you'd probably want to, you know, anyway, let's not go there. So one of the things you could do is when you make a commit, you can associate that commit with a piece of work you're working, like a story that you're working on. So you could put a little, uh, like the number of the story, and Jira would, would come up with that linkage. And this uh, con contractor had basically worked out that um, for every story that was completed, on average, for each story that was completed by this, by this team, they would change six services. So on average, one story would impact six different services. And there were basically there were 40 developer pairs doing two-week sprints. Each developer pair would, on average, complete at least one story per sprint. So that's 40 stories, each of those stories changing at least six services. That basically meant that every single sprint, every single service had 
or in all likelihood had to be changed in some way, shape or form. So now what you've got is what's called a distributed monolith, where everything is so cross-cutting that everything has to be changed together and deployed together. How much fun is it doing a lockstep deployment of a massively distributed system? It sounds like great, doesn't it? It sounds like a lot of fun. And actually, this is a good tip if you're looking at your own microservice decompositional efforts. Keeping an eye on how often a story cuts across multiple service boundaries is a good idea. We can't eliminate that with microservices. We want to reduce that possibility or reduce the frequency of that. You can also use source code tools like CodeScene to look at change couple detection seeing when different parts of your system seem to change in lockstep with each other, that can often point to the fact that your service boundaries are in the wrong place. So anyway, I refer to sort of heavily layered architectures as onion architectures because they have loads and loads of layers, and when I slice through them, um, they make me cry. So <laughs> now these, of course, are kind of specific examples of a more common form of layered architecture and a very, and a very familiar one to many of you, and that would be the classical three-tiered architecture, presentation, business, data access. Part of the reason we see this architecture so much, I'm convinced, is because it is universal. I can do a conference talk about the three-tiered architecture, and at no point do I have to engage at all with a real problem. I don't have to talk about the problem that you're facing or the problem that you're facing. You're building a nuclear power station. Oh, great. Well, what you want is your presentation, your business, your data access. Uh, you're building an e-commerce site. Well, you want your presentation, your business, your data access. It's universal. I can turn up any client in the world. I can get out my ink stamp with my architecture slap it onto a nice A3 sheet, then laminate it and say, that's the architecture you want, right? Presentation, all the front-end logic is in the presentation layer, and there is no business logic in the presentation layer, is there? Because that would make it quite easy to create a decent UI, so we'll keep it all out, because that makes our wife harder. All the business logic is in the business layer. Definitely, there's no behavior in the data access layer. Because the relationships between data and our relational databases don't represent business concepts, do they? Only they do. And we, don't, we definitely are not going to put stored procedures in our database, but we do. So we lie even about what these layers are for. And of course, you know, that's, it's great, it's universal. Everyone can do it. I bet you, if you go back on Monday, I expect at least half of the audience here, if you go and open your code bases and you open your source code, you'll find package structures aligned around these ideas. Presentation, business, data access. Presentation, business, data access. This has become our primary way of finding module boundaries and finding service boundaries and namespace boundaries and package boundaries in our code base. And if you read anything around structured programming from the 1960s and 1970s, we're all insane. But we do it because there's another reason why we do this so much. And that's not just because it's universal. It's actually down to how traditionally IT organizations have being managed and grouped together. Because what do we have? We have the front-end developers who work on the presentation layer. We know who the front-end developers are, don't we? Because they've got the funky haircuts and the tattoos and all the piercings, and they know where the good coffee shops are, and they ride those weird fixed-wheel bikes and talk about JavaScript all day. And then we've got the business developers, the business developers. We own the business services. They own lots of hardback books by Martin Fowler and talk about message brokers and end service bus and talk about application integration patterns and Kafka, right? And they think that all the logic is there and there's no logic anywhere else. And they look down their noses at the front-end developers because they're not real developers, ha, full stack. And then we've got the DBA. We don't know where the DBAs are, but the database seems to be working, but we haven't heard from them for a while. <laughs> and this is the problem. I mean, look, look, this is, speaks to the, the, the sort of the sometimes poisonous tribalism that exists within our organizational structures. I'm, these are stereotypes, but we have stereotypes for people in a camp different from us. This is how we were traditionally organized in IT. You are put in a team with other people with the same core competency as you. You are in a team with other Java developers, if you're a Java developer. If you're a .NET developer, you're in a team of .NET developers. If you're an Xmotif developer, which I was, and none of you know what that is, you're in a team with other Xmotif developers, right? And that you're grouped based on your core competency. And this is based fundamentally on manufacturing theory called Taylorism. And the idea here is if I know all the Java developers are there, I can make sure they're all busy. I can optimize my organizational structure for utilization. If, if, not all, if some of my Java developers aren't doing Java development, I fire them, right? So therefore, everyone makes sure they're doing some Java development. Everyone keeps busy, right? And optimizing for utilization turns out to not at all be the same thing as optimizing for throughput, which is what we learned through the shift from sort of Taylorist views of manufacturing, moving into lean manufacturing. Sometimes the idea is to focus on delivery rather than focus on being busy. 
So this is our traditional organizational structures. This is how we set up. And it aligns to the architectures that we've come up with. By organizing people around their core technical competency, we've ended up with architectures which are driven by technology. All of our database-related functionalities in the data access layer. All of our front-end logic is in the, the front-end presentation layer. So that's where those specialists live. And these things become self-fulfilling. This actually, um, you know, and, and then of course we have the problem that we have all these people, we have the other silos, don't we? We have the QAs that live by themselves, and we had the operations people who lived by themselves, and then they would report up into their structures, and then you'd report up to the CIO and the CTO, and then you'd have the yawning chasm of distrust to the business. And the business is always in air quotes, and sometimes it doesn't apply to an organised crime family. It's like we talk about these as being separate worlds, and this is very old-fashioned now because we've moved away from this, haven't we? We've realized that to be a proper technology business, you, the business makes money through technology. We want closer working relationships. So we're breaking these silos down, and we're also starting to break these silos down as well, right? Getting people working closer together, having more poly-skilled teams. But our architectures often stop that from happening. Our organizational structures are driving our architecture. And this is not a new observation, going all the way back again to the 1960s. 1968, to be exact, when Conway's law was coined. Melvin Conway made the observation which organizations which design systems are constrained to produce designs which are copies of the communication structures of these organizations. So how we've organized ourselves drives our system architecture. And this is, there's been a bunch of studies that have looked into this. One of the best ones, actually, was um, a, a paper that was a bunch of research at Microsoft where they were looking into um, sort of the kind of uh, different metrics around, and, and maybe their correlation of different metrics uh, and correlation with failure rates in the Windows Vista code base. And the Windows Vista code base had a lot of failures to go around. So, and they found that social metrics um, were heavily interacted with those things. So they, so they could see the impact of social groupings, um, so stronger forms of ownership led to better error rates. And there's a bunch of great research out there um, that leads to all these sorts of observations. And this I've always found to be true. Right? The organisation ends up driving the architecture. So if you categorise people based on their core technical skill, you end up with an architecture driven by that core technical skill. So we try and fight against this, and some of you may have heard of the term called the feature-based team. And so rather than having handoffs, we don't want to avoid handoffs, right? Because if I have to ask the presentation team to do something, and then, but they can't do that until the business layer team have done something, and they can't do that until the DBAs have done something, we're constantly having to hand off and coordinate between people. Like Lean Manufacturing 101 is that the way you optimize for throughput is, is avoiding handoffs. Like, I might go and ask you to do something. You say, well, that piece of work's only going to take me a week. And I say, great, that's fine. And you say, I'll get to it in six months because I've got other things on right now. That's what happens when we have multiple teams trying to coordinate with each other. So feature-based teams are a way to try and solve this. What you do is you get together a collection of individuals who, and in that team, you have the skill sets of, uh, of required to make all the changes to deliver a feature. So a team owns the end-to-end -end delivery of a piece of functionality. And this will be a piece of user-facing functionality. So you might have within that team someone that can do some database work. You have some, say, services developers and some front-end developers. This whole full-stack developer stuff is rubbish, right? As Charity Majors says, you're not a full-stack developer unless you design the chips. We don't need full-stack developers. What we need are full-stack teams. The idea that one person can be a brilliant front-end developer and a brilliant services developer and a great data administrator and a great operations person, maybe one of those people exists and maybe I'll get to meet them one day. What we're looking at here are poly-skilled teams, people who want, are okay being flexible in where they work. Kind of the interesting thing is you look into it, if you're a Java developer and you're a great Java developer, sometimes the right thing to do is not write some Java code. It might be to help out in some other area of the, of the development process to get a feature out of the door. So you get a close working relationship those people who might work on different parts of the stack historically are much more now aligned about delivering a piece of functionality to the customer. They can work closely together. You're avoiding the handoffs because you're working in the same team. And now they can make the changes in all the layers and all the places that need those changes to be made.
The problem, though, is when you start trying to apply these cross-cutting feature-based teams on top of an architecture which isn't aligned around that, is you end up with all sources of contention. Because guess what? I'm trying to make these changes and get my feature out, but I'm probably not the only feature-based team all fighting in the same area. Like, I want to get my change out, but I can't because there's other teams doing a refactoring in that layer, and they want me to wait till their refactoring is done, and, oh, no, there's yet a third team that says, hang on a minute, you can't deploy anything this week because we've got to roll out a database change. So when you get multiple teams all trying to work on the same piece of code and all trying to work and coordinate around releasing the same artifacts, you get all these horrible sources of contention. And that can be even more complicated if you still have teams working at right angles to you. So the feature-based team isn't inherently a bad idea, but the idea of owning end-to-end -end the delivery of a piece of functionality to a customer, having a poly-skilled team that can avoid handoffs, those are great ideas. The problem is sometimes these layered architectures don't allow those great teams to work effectively. And in my experience, it tends to be the organization that wins, but the organization wins very, very slowly, right? So this is where you get all these sources of contention and infighting. Fundamentally, we've got multiple teams all scrapping it out in the same area, and they're having to coordinate the changes they make and coordinate the deployments that we want to make. So, it's a nice idea, these end-to-end -end slices. We like the idea of having end-to-end -end delivery a piece of functionality. So with microservices, what we say is, well, rather than decomposing our system around technical lines with these end-to-end -end sort of, these, sort of uh, these horizontal slices, Instead, we make end-to-end -end slices our unit of decomposition. If we want to own pieces of functionality, we'll own those pieces of functionality end-to-end. -end. So these end-to-end -end slices here, they become our service boundaries. Ooh. So within each service, we take those end-to-end -end slices and we peel those off and say that is actually a service boundary. And inside that service boundary, we might have, maybe we have those three layers of presentation, data, access, business layers. As you start peeling these things apart, sometimes some things don't need databases, sometimes they don't need front ends. But the idea now is when I'm working in a team and a team owns a service, that's a polyskilled team owning a piece of a functionality, business functionality. We're optimizing our architecture around these business domains to, to increase the chance that when we do changes, they're going to sit within those service boundaries. Like when I, I want stories to not have to cut across loads of different teams and loads across the service ownership. So as I'm making changes, I want those to be as easy as possible to get out into production. Functionally, that's what microservices are all about. Really, I think uh, Neil Ford once said that microservices are the first post-DevOps architecture, which I think is kind of right in a way. But I would argue that even more influential has been continuous delivery. I can say that because that's what influenced me to, come to, to work on all this stuff. The idea of getting software out of the door quickly and effectively and safely Right, these ideas that came from continuous delivery, which is treating every check-in as a release candidate, getting that software out as quickly as possible, reducing your batch sizes. Evidence has shown that those organizations which release software more quickly also have, uh, more, more frequently, also have significantly lower failure rates. They tend also to have companies where the developers are happier and the businesses perform better. Right, we've got data on this now. We know continuous delivery as a concept works, what we're now looking at are architectures that make continuous delivery easier to do. And that's what microservices are really about, this idea of independent deployability. If I want to get a change out easily, I want to be able to make a change and deploy that service in isolation. It reduces the risk of each deployment. We then start talking about these ownership models. And I've always sort of kind of come in and said, well, actually, this idea that a team should own a service. It's not all the only model that people look at, though. So in the rest of the talk, I want to look at some different options around owning services and what that might mean for your organizations. Um, Martin Fowler wrote a piece a while ago on code ownership. And so he introduced these terms, um, kind of strong code ownership, weak, and collective code ownership. Now, it's worth pointing out that when Martin was talking about these ideas, he was talking about modules and code, not necessarily services. So he talked about sort of strong ownership of a, of, of a piece of code basically means um, these people can change this code and nobody else can. If anybody else wants to change this code, they have to come and ask the owners of a piece of code. So within an organization, they might be part of your code base, which is owned by a small set of individuals, and those are the people who are responsible for that, for that piece of code. 
but they also vet any changes that anybody else makes, and they effectively act as gatekeepers around that piece of code. We sort of have weak ownership, which I don't think really ever exists. In weak ownership, you can commit into other people's code, but you're expected to check in with someone before you do it and ask, is that OK? I find weak ownership to very rarely exist. At the other end of the spectrum, we have collective ownership. Anybody can change anything. And that's an, often an idea that um, is put out there by certain people. And for some situations, it works well. But in other situations, it can be quite disastrous. Anybody can change anything. So everybody's in charge of everything. It has some real nice benefits, though. So here I am. I've got three teams, and I've got a bunch of services. And I say, well, I'm allowing anybody to change any one of these services. That gives you a degree of flexibility around how you work. There's a lot of changes need to be done in how we're doing shipping. Well, we can have more people storming around that area of the code. You get e it makes it easier to rotate people around. So that's quite nice. You get a lot more flexibility in terms of where you assign people. You sort of view people, in a way, as being a bit more fungible. Well, you've done some shipping work. You can go and do work over there, or you can work over there, or you can work over there. You'll be fine. It'll be absolutely OK. One of the kind of interesting challenges, though, is when you have this sort of idea of collective ownership that anybody can change anything, who's sort of responsible for the technical vision of that piece of the code? Or what represents a good commit? Uh, or which direction do we want to go in? Should we be doing this major refactoring? Actually, we want to clean this code up. Who's thinking about those things? If you skip from one part of the system to another, and there's no real sense of ownership from that point of view, it's very hard to make those things work. Coming back to that Windows Vista study I mentioned, um, Microsoft found that there's a very good correlation between ownership churn and failure rates that they see in, in their own internal projects. The higher the churn of owners, the higher the defect rates. And that, that kind of makes some logical sense in a way, because people are going in and making changes without realizing the impact of those changes. The other issue here is being aligned to parts of the business. I talked about this idea that we're trying to break down the silos between you know, the business and IT. But here, I'm sort of this idea, well, I could work on any part of my technical landscape. But often, you know, you'll have different product owners for different parts of your organization. But if the developers are skipping all around it, they're not going to build up any domain expertise. And they don't really feel aligned to the business. It still feels a bit more like we're just a pool of developers being moved around. And fundamentally, we still have the coordination problem here. Anybody could change any service. So how am I sure which services are being changed by somebody else? Now, I do think this is all about scale. I think for small teams, I think if you've got like 15, 20 people, I actually think collective ownership is all right. I think of many of those issues around a lack of ownership, they are really, uh, they, they really are fine. When you've got 10, 15, 20 people, you can coordinate about all of this stuff. You can be on the same page. You can have a collective view with 15 or 20 people, just about. You start getting much beyond that, and it's very hard to get agreement on things. So I think as your organization grows, as you have more teams, as you have more developers, the concept of collective ownership inherently starts to break down, unless you have a lot more top-down control and constraint. So collective code ownership, often the way we would deal with wanting some understanding about how things are done in a of collective ownership, is you have lots of people saying, this is what a good commitment looks like. This is the changes you are allowed to make. You'd have a small number of individuals that would be setting out the architecture that you have to work within, for example. And that's sort of how you try and make collective ownership work at scale. And effectively, what that means is you take away the concept of ownership from the people and you centralize it. So the other model here is more of a strong ownership model. So here, teams own services. So these services are owned by certain teams. This is my stuff. This is ours. We are responsible for it. And this model also makes much more sense if you're looking at moving towards a model where your teams are also handling the deployment and operational aspects of your services, because now your sphere of responsibility extends into the operational domain. And I don't know anybody that has sort of that full operational ownership and does collective ownership at a scale. Those two ideas don't really work together. So here, I've got very clear lines of ownership. I understand who owns the user service. I also understand who is responsible and accountable for that service. I have an, an increased concept here of autonomy. I now can free up, if I want to, the teams owning these services to make whatever changes they like, because they are the, win the ones that live with those changes. I'm not worried about somebody else coming in and going, 
well, hang on, this is written in Python and I'm a PHP developer. Well, that's fine because, you know, they don't work in that area. When you have collective ownership, you tend to standardize in your languages. You tend to standardize in your technology choices. You standardize on your technical idioms that you're using because you know a person is going to probably pop into your project and work there for a few weeks before going off again. When you have stronger lines of ownership, you actually free people up to make more changes locally and optimize locally. When you optimize locally, you might end up with inconsistency, but that still might make people more productive. It's also, I think someone should get that. Um, it's also much easier here to become aligned to parts of the business. And in fact, often the way you'll drive team boundaries is by identifying team boundaries that align to existing organizational business structures. You know, the classic model now you see of product-oriented teams where a product owner is embedded inside a technical delivery team. I work on this part of the business domain. I get to know my product owner really well. I become basically a domain expert as well as being a technical expert on this part of the system. And that makes you much more effective as a developer. There are some challenges with this model. One of the issues is about bottlenecks. Like what happens if this team is really under the pump? There's loads of change that need to get made right now in the account system. How are we gonna make that work if they're the only team that can make changes there? Another issue that can come up here is if, if a if services are owned by one team, what happens when that team goes away? What happens if that team no longer exists anymore? Things become, can become orphaned. You know, you don't realize it. You've got something running in production that's been there for like five years. You're not sure what it does, but you know when you shut it down, the system stops working. And you can't find the source code, right? So we have to talk about how we're going to solve that as well. And there is also this balance of global versus local optimization. If you give these teams more autonomy, they might make different decisions than other teams. Is that a problem? How much autonomy do you allow them? Now, I think in general, as I've already touched on, I think the challenges we outline with collective ownership, they're fine at small scale. When you've got 5, 10, 15 developers, they're fine. When you start getting with multiple teams, or you've got lots of geographical distribution, collective ownership really, really struggles. You'll start seeing all kinds of bad outcomes, in my experience. But it exists a bit on a spectrum. We think about collective ownership and strong ownership, they're kind of at e e the extreme ends of the spectrum. And, and you can play around with where you want this, this balance to be for your own organizations. With collective ownership, you're going to find a lot a, a stronger need for global consistency. Because anybody can change anything, you're not going to want a huge amount of variation. You're going to want to keep your choices to the same or similar. You're probably going to have to have more consistency, and you might have to have that consistency enforced. That might result in you putting constraints in terms of what people are allowed to do, or the new techniques or technologies that they're allowed to introduce into their organization. And that's to try and make collective ownership work. If you want to allow for local teams to make the decisions that are best for them, strong ownership makes more sense. This team could come up with a very different answer to this team, but it works for them. They are more efficient. They also feel more empowered. Uh, some of you may have, uh, as, uh, Dan Pink came up with sort of these, uh, these sort of three pillars of motivation for, uh, uh, for sort of employee and staff. And it talks about um, autonomy, mastery, and purpose. It's sort of interesting, right? Because purpose is like, what am I doing here? What's, my, what's the point of being here? And, and you actually probably do want an aligned purpose across your organization that kind of speaks to your company culture. Autonomy, if someone else is telling me what to do, I don't have much autonomy, right? So organizations where you have collective ownership and theoretically everybody's in charge, we know that's not always the case. And so your autonomy can often suffer. But if you're free to make your own decisions a bit more, your autonomy is going to be better. That also opens up the possibility of improving your skills mastery as well, because you're freer to try and learn and use new things. Now, you don't have to be at either end of this extreme. <coughs> But you've just got to recognize that this trade-off and this balance exists. And you've just got to decide what makes sense for you and your organization. Now, when it comes to microservices, the microservice architecture, I mean, everything we've talked about so far is just about generic systems. When we talk about microservice architectures, we're focusing on this idea of independent deployability. We want to be able to make a change to a service and deploy that service into production without having to worry about impacting or changing anybody else. So that means we much, care much more about having loosely coupled architectures, and we want to reduce coordination as much as possible. Organizations which have embraced and get the most value out of microservices tend to have much stronger concepts of ownership, 
and they tend to give teams more autonomy. I have very, very rarely seen collective ownership work. I've never seen collective ownership work at scale. I'm just going to say it. We'll come back to some of the things you're thinking about. Like, what about GitHub in a minute? Um, let's take a look at an organization that has chosen for a fairly extreme form of local optimization and autonomy, and that's Amazon. Amazon of the famous two pizza team, who Amazon, who ended up effectively creating their most profitable product, AWS, was inspired partly by services they provided their own teams to allow them to work independently from each other. Product development at Amazon is extremely isolated. Um, so, you know, those product-oriented teams do not talk to each other very much. They do not align much on how their product strategy. Uh, reInvent two years ago, um, Amazon released their managed uh, Kubernetes host service, EKS. It was the least well-kept secret in the cloud world. The same day, the same keynote, I think, they also announced um, their, their revolutionary cloud service that allows you to basically run a container and be charged on a per second basis. I say revolutionary because it was only about nine months after Microsoft launched the same service. So, you, OK, I've got per second price containers. That's built by one team. I think it's the Fargate team or Farscape. I always get those too confused. And managed Kubernetes, which is about running containers. That was done by a different team, and the question was asked, so can I run per second price containers on, on EKS? And they go, oh, no, we haven't looked into that. Not join up at all. An even worse example of this would be AWS Lambda, launched in 2014. So Lambda allows you to run a piece of functionality based on something happening. Amazon's first ever product that they launched, AWS's first ever product, was called SQS, a simple queue service, 2006. A serverless queue. You can put an item on a queue and you can react when that item is put on the queue. Lambda launched in 2014. It took until 2018 that you could put an item in SQS and have a trigger a Lambda function. Four years. So it looks nuts at one level, but that's by design. Coordinating around a product strategy slows you down. The decision Amazon have made is we want to optimize to reduce coordination as much as possible so that we can go fast and get product out. And you can't say it's not working for them because they're far and away the biggest public cloud provider and it's not even close, right? Now that leads to a disjointed product strategy, absolutely, but they've made that decision. That's a trade-off they've made. They've optimized around local optimization. You've got like five different ways of doing the same thing in Amazon in loads of places, loads of places. There's a huge overlap. Works for them, though. You might not want that in your own organization. You might want something a bit more in the middle. It's a choice that you get to make. But Amazon fundamentally prioritizes for local optimization in terms of how the teams work, in terms of how the product strategy works. And we see the benefits and the downsides of that as, as customers of AWS. So coming back to that collective ownership, we, we talked about a few of the challenges that are associated with these collective ownership models. We have bottlenecks, we have orphan services, and we have local optimization issues. So bottlenecks, how do we solve bottlenecks? I've got a service that's got too much work to be done. This team is totally overwhelmed. The work is piling up, and they're becoming a bottleneck for the rest of the system. So how can we solve this? Well, one option is we could move people. I could add a person to the team. That's going to be much harder if people are using different programming languages. But if I've got the same programming language, moving people might be OK. And actually, a lot of organizations that do allow for high degrees of local autonomy will still say, we have a certain number of languages that we support. Like, actually, we mostly code in Go, or we mostly code in C Sharp, or we mostly code in Node. And if you want to do it, go outside of that, you have to have a conversation. Outside of that, you can do what you want. But that gives them some flexibility in terms of recruitment, in terms of moving people around, and also in terms of shared tooling and code. Another example would be a pull request. A pull request-based model is fundamentally a strong ownership model. When you, if you're doing internal open source, you are basically practicing a strong ownership model. You have people, oh, you have people who have commit rights. When you send a pull request to that team, oh, blimey, too many transitions, and say, please, can you take my change? You've got gatekeepers who are saying that, yes, that, that change is acceptable. I'm going to accept that change. That's a strong ownership model. 
Right? Pull requests are a really effective solution for that. But if you're going to try and use a pull request or an internal inner source based model inside your own organization, and if you want to make that work, then it's also got to be part of your team responsibility to actually make it easy for people to send your pull requests. You've got to denote, you've got to set aside time to help work with those people sending those pull requests to make sure the changes are made correctly. You've actually got to make, actually make time to merge those changes in. Done well, it allows you to remove a lot of these bottlenecks. And I've seen it work incredibly well at organizations. I've seen other organizations who say, oh, we do internal open source. And what they mean is they've got GitHub Enterprise. Right? It's actually a working practice thing. And again, if you're on a team to send you a pull request, they've got to know how to use your programming language. There may be still some degree of consistency that you want across that system. Often services get a bit more problematic. You know, over time, the people will drift off, they leave the company, they move on. And this happens quite a lot with older microservice organizations. And the, the problem is we've created these services that do one thing and do them well, and they often don't need to change very much. So they're out there running. We may not have, no, we may, may not have had to do anything with them for weeks or months at an end. And then we realize, oh, hang on, no one uses it anymore. So what can we do here? Well, um, the first thing is knowing it's happening. Um, I, chatted to uh, Sarah Wells, who's head of, uh, sort of uh, resiliency and operations for the Financial Times, and actually looking at this problem at the moment. And so for where they've got services that don't have a concrete assigned owner, they're basically operating the who touched it last policy, which is if you committed on it last, it's now yours. Which I quite like that idea, right? You were near it when it was last working, so you're now on the hook for this. Um, which I think is quite good for people we, we are trying to, and especially that makes sense if you're trying to move to a strong ownership model. That often is, makes the most sense. Another answer here is just to say, well, just take ownership. Often the reason you are trying to find who owns the customer service is because you need to do something to it. Well, then it's now yours. You take ownership for that. You now own that service. You now get the commit rights. It's now part of what you're doing. Um, the other model that can work is a, is a model I call the roving custodian. And that's where you have people that know how that service works. They're no longer in a team together, but they're still in your organization. And they might be scattered all over the place. And you just go and find one of them and say, look, I want to make a change. Can we pair on this change and get it committed? And they still vet those changes. Again, for that roving custodian model to work, those people may now be in other teams, but it's got to be recognized that as part of their job, they're still looking after this service as well. That roving custodian model doesn't tend to work for services that have sort of operational upkeep requirements. Um, but it can work well for services that are maybe run by a separate operations team or for um, things like shared code and shared libraries and things like that. So, a bunch of ideas there. Last point. We talked a little bit about this local optimization versus global optimization thing. And, I was, uh, and, and the, the, the thing we have to realize is that these things are not, there's not one right answer for everybody. And that it's a constant ongoing balancing act that you're going to be doing in terms of how much variation do you allow from team to team to team versus how much consistency do you want. So I've got a team here, the shipping team have decided they want to use Mongo because they want to be web scale. Uh, we've got this team here. Um, who wants to use Oracle because as they've already got Oracle and it seems to be working fine and they operate the if it ain't broke don't, don't touch it kind of philosophy. That's well, fine, right? And then we've got a team over here that is going to build their system using Cassandra um, because they think they're going to have lots of rights because our product is quite poor and we're assuming lots of people are going to be returning our stuff, right? Um, now you could go to each of those teams in this situation and talk to them and understand what they're trying to solve, the problems they're facing, their skill sets, and you can say, you know what, each of those teams has made a completely valid and sensible judgment about what to do. I can understand why the shipping team wants Mongo. I can understand why the customer service team wants Oracle. I can understand why the returns team thinks Cassandra is a great idea. And each one of those decisions makes perfect sense just looked at in local context. But when you start looking across the piece, you go, do we want to maintain three different types of databases? Do we want to build up the skill sets required in our organization to run those things effectively in a production environment? Do I want to manage three different sets of vendor relationships? Do I want to worry about three different sets of security upgrades and things that I'm going to have to keep on touch of? Or maybe it makes sense at a global level to say, can we just pick one of these? Is there one that's good enough? It's not perfect for everybody, but if we have one, it might be fine. Maybe we say, can everyone use Mongo? 
right? Maybe you go to and the, oracle, the customer service people go, oh, well, I suppose we could move. It's not that bad, right? Sometimes standardizing across the piece makes sense. Um, early on, uh, Netflix, when they obviously kind of when they moved a lot of their uh, estate over to AWS, and have made a very early decision to standardize all of their main data storage onto Cassandra. And their argument was, look, we know it scales really well, and we want to scale the company. So that was one of the big drivers. Um, but they also accepted that it wasn't perfect for everything, but it was good enough for virtually everything. And what they did was, they said, well, you're gonna use Cassandra, but we're gonna make Cassandra amazingly easy to use. So they put a lot of work into spinning up Cassandra clusters, managing them, handling the operational cycles around those things as well, because that allowed them to optimize at a global level. Now, I can't say what the right answer is for any of you, but for you to make a decision about, do I want to worry more about local optimization in this regard or global optimization in this regard, you kind of need to know what's going on. How would I even know that all these teams are doing these different things? And this is one challenge I see certainly with startup, uh, with scale-ups, people have grown quite quickly, is that you lose track of what's happening. So how would I even know that we've got three different teams thinking about three different databases? If I have that knowledge, I can at least start to make a decision about what we want to do as an organization. And sometimes, what, basically what you need here is, we almost need those cross-cutting groups. We need another overlay on top of this. We've gone from centralized, competency-based organizational structures, which don't necessarily work when we want fast throughput. But now we kind of do need somebody looking across the piece at certain aspects of our technology. But rather than this being the main driving force of our organization, it's an overlay. This could be as simple as having like a community of practice. Do you have a place where all of your teams can come together and chat about the issues you're facing? Uh, you might even, in some situations, want some more overt governance in this area. Um, but this can be a much more collective activity. As a really simple example of how I've done this before in a few organizations, is we would just get the tech leads from each of those teams, we'd catch up every couple of weeks, say, what's going on? And then we'd use that to surface up these sorts of issues. But if you don't have something that cuts across this and some ability to look across all the services and what's going on, you're not actually going to be able to make that balancing decision. OK, we've had 15 different databases now. Should we try and slim it down to five? Right? If you don't know you've got those 15 different databases out there, you can't make those judgment calls. Now, I think this can make people worry that, OK, we've moved to microservices. We've got to change everything. We've got to rip the whole system apart, and, and we've got to start again with our, our operational structure. And I don't think that's the case. I think if you've gone from an environment where you're building a monolithic system, you will tend to have a higher degree of sort of global consistency across that monolith. You will often have more of a concept of collective ownership. As you move to microservices, you're likely going to want to look at to moving towards stronger ownership. This service is owned by this peop these people. And that allows them to iterate more quickly and own the end-to-end -end delivery of that software. And so probably over time, you're going to be moving from more from a world where everyone does things in exactly the same way, and you're going to start inching your way maybe back towards a, a world of, of local optimization. Fundamentally, microservices are an architecture which optimizes for autonomy. They're an architecture which allows your teams to take on more responsibility. And that's one of the big, massive, ish, massive selling points of microservice architecture. If you go buy into microservices and say, we're going to buy into microservices, but we're going to make all these decisions essentially, and everything has to be done in the same way, you're missing a huge part of the benefit they bring, but still paying all the costs, right? So I think you need to be a bit more relaxed about this. This balance, by the way, between local and global is not going to be static. It's going to change as your organization changes and as you use things. It's up to you, though, when you start this journey as to how much autonomy you want. There's no sense in saying, right, we're doing microservices, and now, Bob, you're carrying a pager. You're now doing 24-7 support. Uh, and you've got to manage our databases. And it's like, people's heads are going to explode, and they're all going to leave the company, right? As you start pushing these responsibilities into the team, those teams are going to need help to learn those new skills. The way this works is you take those traditional centralized functions, the DBAs, the operations team, maybe even the QAs, but certainly your security team who are still these centralized resources, and you say, no, no, those teams now have to change their role. Those people are now going to embed themselves in those teams. They're going to help transfer those skills. They're going to help those teams become more, dare I say it, full stack, right? 
uh, and that's a shift, but that doesn't have to be done overnight. But it does need to be done consciously. It doesn't happen automatically. You don't get autonomy if you say, let's do microservices. You have to think a little bit about how you shift the ownership of, of, of activities inside your organization. This is a constant balance that you're going to be going on. Do I want to be globally consistent everywhere? Do I want to do local optimization? And some organizations are here, right? You hear about Monzo, who have their 800 services. Um, and they have actually, a sh they, have, they, they veer more towards collective. They also have a, a very, very standardized development process and a very, very standardized development stack. They don't allow for a lot of variation because people have to be able to move around. Maybe that's right for you as well. Who knows? But you've got to make that decision. Um, I've got a load more resources over on my website. You can find information about my book. There's a video of this talk is going to be available afterwards if you want to share it with your colleagues. But talks for lots of the other things I've, uh, videos for lots of the other talks I've done are available online. Um, but thank you so much for your time. Uh, we've got, I think, five minutes for questions. If anyone's got any questions for me. Uh, Go ahead. Uh, so if, if you take your, your music shop uh, and you have uh, different uh, services, you have your account service, you have your shipping service, yep. and all those microservices need to, to interact and talk to each other uh, to do their stuff. Yep. So how do you maintain cohesion and, and consistency in what if the service fails? So the question was, with a microservice architecture, I've, I'm breaking these things up into services. So now I've got the account service and the shipping service, and they've got to interact. Um, how do you maintain sort of a consistency or about what if the service fails? Uh, for me, so, so the question is basically what do you do when services fail? This isn't really an issue of consistency or anything else like this. It's more about what you, your expectations are of any service you call. So if I call a service and I make use of a service, um, you need to have a shared understanding from you, the person calling the service, and from the person providing that service about what your expectations are in terms of their SLOs, service level objectives. So what you would do as a, as a team who owns a service is you say, well, this is our service. This is how critical this service is to the people that use us. Because remember, a service only exists to be called, right? So you're going to be thinking, who calls my service and what do they need? So if you own the shipping service, and I'm calling the shipping service, I would have expectations about your uptime or your availability or how much acceptable downtime that you're going to have. Now, if you're not a critical service and you only need to be up once a week, Guess what? Happy days for you. I can't be cross if you're only up once a week, because that's what we agreed. But if your service needs to be up, it needs to be up. There's no two ways around that. The responsibility, where the responsibility lies for uptime, is a bit more up for grabs. So some organizations practice the idea that the team owns the life cycle of that service end to end. They, that team also owns responsibility for it running in production. Um, that model works well for some. In other organizations, the team that develops that service will hand that over to a more of a centralized operations department. And then the responsibility for that service being up would shift to the operators who are looking after that system. But fundamentally, if you're going to talk to a service, you need to have some expectation that it's going to be up. And if you haven't had the conversation about what you need, you need to have the conversation. So either you, so in some organizations I've worked, they'll be like across the board, they'll have a basic SLO. So you, you can say, well, when you go to any service, here's what you can expect. You can expect that service will be up between the hours of 8 a.m. and 7 p.m. Um, and anything outside of that is up for grabs, but you'll get, and you'll get office support during those hours. Um, and then there'll be variations on top of that. So if you don't, but you've got to work that out yourselves. And every organization is a bit different in terms of how critical different services are going to be. Cool. A question here. Um, well, there's sort of a systems and an organizational structure. I mean, if we were going, going full Conway, and you want to go full Conway if you can, right? So I've got one sort of maybe called a division, and that division is like everyone owns everything. And then I've got a strong ownership here, so I've got services. Um, I would try and be really clear in terms of how that division talks to this division. 
So I would still be very explicit in saying these are the interaction points from your world to my world. So if the, uh, you know, if the collective to ownership people are calling into services owned by the strong ownership people, I think this model gets quite clear. Which endpoints do you use? Who owns those endpoints? What do you expect? These are the teams you need to talk to. And actually, uh, internally, this gets easier. I need to talk to that team and that team and that team. They're the people that provide my services. And I get that because they've got strong ownership. When you're going the other way, it becomes quite messy. But fundamentally, if you're calling services owned by the collective ownership part of the world, you've got to be able to say, let's just what we talked about there. What are my SLOs? Who owns those SLOs? Who do I talk to about what my requirements are? They can say their collective ownership all they want, but fundamentally then somebody has got to come with you and say, this is what we're going to do, and this is what we're going to work towards. So to an extent, if they want to work internally in this sort of hippie commune collective mindset with their drum circle or whatever, that's great but they still have responsibilities to the wider organisation. And if they want to fulfil that collectively, that's fine, but you should still be able to have a conversation about what those responsibilities are and also hold them to account when they don't deliver. Um, you, you, you may well find if you start having that conversation with them that that collective ownership starts becoming a lot less collective. <coughs> OK, any other questions? It's a bit hard for me to see, I apologise. Okay, well, thank you so much for your time. If you want to email me, my details are on the internet. Um, um, and Twitter's often good for answering questions because um, everyone can see the answers there. Uh, but thank you very much, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. <laughs>